Hi there, and uh, welcome to this webinar. This is Dr. John Carazella, and I am the Chief Physician and Founder of the Florida Center for Hormones and Wellness, uh, located in beautiful, sunny Orlando, Florida. And I want to welcome you to this webinar. I think that uh, many of you men out there will find it very interesting and informative. And, you know, I'm also sure that some of the ladies out there are going to find it interesting as if they're listening to see what they can do for their guys, there are going to be some very uh, useful ideas and techniques and thoughts here. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about some real medically founded ways to deal with this very serious issue and uh, ways that aren't gimmicky. That all of them have significant medical science behind them, and you will see that as we progress. So uh, let's jump right in and start uh, talking about the 21 ways to combat erectile dysfunction in men that actually work. A little bit about myself before we get going. Uh, I uh, have uh, been around a little bit. I grew up in Wallingford, Connecticut and went to Yale University. Uh, after I finished medical school, I ended up in residency in Cincinnati. I was initially an orthopedic surgeon and I, I did pretty well there. I was always top 5% in my class and did well on my boards and uh, all of the certifying exams that I took. I practiced orthopedic surgery for about uh, 25 years. And after a uh, real life changing experience, uh, decided that that wasn't uh, really the thing for me and eventually got into the wellness field. As you can see, I uh, became a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Aesthetic Medicine in 2011 and have gotten several advanced certifications along the way. And finally, last year in August of 2016, I got a master's degree in nutritional and metabolic medicine. And I specialize in hormones and metabolic medicine with a particular emphasis and sexual dysfunction in both the men and the women. Well, tonight, we're going to speak primarily about erectile dysfunction, which, funny enough, is a growing problem in the United States, though many men may not think so. Uh, what you can see here is that as many as 52% of men may experience some erectile dysfunction at some point in their life, and it's increasing with increasing age. The big problem that we see, though, it's, it's quite underreported. Obviously, this is an embarrassing and difficult subject for many men to talk about, uh, and it really is something that a lot of doctors uh, are not equipped to handle in their offices and almost uh, consciously avoid talking about. But unfortunately, it is something that almost every man will deal with in some form or another at some point in his life. But when we talk about true, symptomatic, really clinically relevant erectile dysfunction, what are we talking about? We're talking about a chronic, that is an ongoing inability to achieve or sustain an erection satisfactory for sexual intercourse. It really does not include the episodic inst instances of failure that occur from, you know, whether you've had too much to drink that night, you're in a bad mood, have had a bad day at work, or having temporary relationship problems. I'm talking more about the chronic, long-term, ongoing issues uh, that uh, many men will have. Now, let's talk about the causes. In most cases, ED is caused by some physical or physiological problem. Some are reversible, some are manageable. However, unfortunately, some of them are irreversible and permanent. And in this slide right here, you can see, and we'll get a little bit more into detail later, uh, that there are a number of uh, specific diseases, a number of which we're going to go over, some physical problems from injury, paraplegia, radiation, even wearing tight clothes can be a problem that causes ED. And then we're going to talk a good bit about unhealthy lifestyles and things uh, that can lead to ED from a physiological standpoint. So what are the lifestyle causes? Well, obviously, smoking is well known to be a, a cause of uh, ED. Alcohol, lack of exercises, obesity, some of the emotional and psychological causes, depression, anxiety, other psychological issues, relationship issues, and one that I was just absolutely stunned to find is that more and more young people are being affected by what is called pornography-induced erectile dysfunction. That is, young men are looking at so much pornography that when the real time comes to perform, they can't do it. Did you know that medications, particularly things like beta blockers, cause uh, erectile dysfunction? Other issues such as diabetes, sugar metabolism, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia or high cholesterol, 
inflammatory diets or really the standard American diet that's fried food laden, cholesterol laden, sugar laden, those kind of things, depleted antioxidants and oxidative stress, nitric oxide, testosterone. Low testosterone is a big cause or at least a contributor toward erectile dysfunction. We have neurological injuries such as spinal cord. We have neurological injuries that occur after prostate surgery. And we have, uh, we have uh, to talk, in, in order for us to really understand erectile dysfunction, we have to know a little bit about the normal physio physiology. And I'm not going to bore you all with all of the complex interrelationships, but suffice it to say that normal physiology is complex. It starts up in the brain, it goes down through the spinal cord, and then it's manifested out in the sexual organs. And we can see that not only is it a neurological process, there's a lot of physiological and chemical processes that occur. That is, once the nerve endings fire down in the area of the erectile tissue, nitrous oxide is generated, and that promotes a whole bunch of different um, uh, physiological processes and chemicals that then cause a smooth muscle contraction, causing blood to be trapped in the erectile tissue, and thus the end result that the men are all looking for that erection that's satisfactory to produce a successful uh, sexual encounter. However, sometimes things go wrong, and they go wrong for a variety of different things. Now, obviously, trauma is self-explanatory, but we can look at a number of uh, physiological changes that can cause both structural and functional changes in the erectile function of the man. And you can see some very common illnesses and diseases are directly responsible for erectile dysfunction. And what we see is uh, uh, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. That is the artery gets very small. Uh, we get blood flow insufficiency. You get reduced blood flow to the erectile tissues and therefore you can't sustain an erection for a successful sex. Uh, and you can see here again that these structural and functional changes can be very complex. So, Here's the way I look at it, okay? Of Viagra is really the primary way that a lot of people think that testosterone, or I'm sorry, that erectile dysfunction can be cured. And they think that's about it, one thing. But really, Viagra is just a roll of the dice. It really doesn't work as well as it should. Uh, it really doesn't work as frequently as it should. And sometimes it just doesn't work at all. But no worries, there's ways to deal with that. So let's get started. Let's kind of jump right in. One of the biggest and most common ways uh, that we can reverse erectile dysfunction is we can change our lifestyle. And what I like to say is stop smoking. So if you're having trouble getting it up, you'll need to learn to put it down. You know, the chemicals in cigarette smoke directly injure the blood vessels and they impair the erectile tissue. So when you use those cigarettes, you're actually causing direct damage to the blood vessels and sometimes the nerves that are responsible for uh, erectile function. Smoking is mediated directly, and it can also be mediated through a number of diseases that you can see here, disease processes that are directly related to smoking. So according to the American Journal of Epidemiology, we looked, they looked at 173 current smokers, 661 prior smokers, and quite a number of never smokers. And they found that people who smoke have 2.74 times the risk of having erectile dysfunction as non-smokers. With those that are prior smokers, guys that have smoked in the past that have quit somewhere in between. And it is a directly dose-related problem. That is, the more you smoke, the harder it is to overcome that smoking problem once you put the cigarettes down. Again, in another study in 2013, a very large study involving 28,000 patients, the overall risk of erectile dysfunction in smokers was one and a half times that uh, as, uh, as non-smokers. And again, prior smokers saw an improvement that was dose related. And finally, the British Journal of Urology shows that if you stop smoking, after one year, you may have a 25% improvement in your erectile function. So the lesson here is, is if you're a smoker and have ED, if you're a smoker and have ED, put them down. Let's talk about alcohol. 
low dose alcohol can be very helpful and can enhance desire. However, heavy, dro uh, heavy drinkers and high doses of alcohol can suppress the normal physiology and ru uh, ruin the romantic mood, and it can actually ruin the romantic performance. So we can see that regular alcohol consumption in large doses can lead not only to erectile problems and reduce sexual desire, it can cause endothelial dysfunction and with resulting in erectile dysfunction. And that's right out of the medical literature of pharmacology reports in 2008. Let's look at another lifestyle change that may be beneficial. Did you know that exercising regularly will improve sexual function? Well, there's plenty of literature to support that. If you look at clinical hypertension in 2009, they showed that exercise training for 45 to 60 minutes a day improved erectile dysfunction when compared to people who did not exercise. Uh, we also see from another reputable journal that moderate and sometimes high stress physical activities are lower, were associated with a lower risk of erectile dysfunction and actual 40% risk reduction. Aerobic exercise and physical exercise can improve endothelial dysfunction, I'm sorry, improve endothelial function in middle-aged men with erectile dysfunction, and a well-rounded exercise program can improve the effectiveness of PDE5 inhibitors, things like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra. So exercise, and you can improve your performance in the bedroom. Another big one, so to speak, is obesity. Men with, uh, obesity is de defined as men who have a waist circumference at the navel of greater than 40 inches. Now, that's a general rule. There are a lot of smaller men who don't need to be that big that can be considered obese. But there's a clear association. Again, when people are obese, they have this problem called visceral fat. Visceral fat is an extremely, uh, I'm sorry, an extremely inflammatory tissue. And that inflammation products that are produced in the visceral fat lead to our favorite friend, endothelial dysfunction. And as I like to tell my men in my office, ED, endothelial dysfunction, leads to ED. So when you're having endothelial dysfunction, you're going to have erectile dysfunction. And endothelial dysfunction is a direct result of the inflammatory factors that are produced in visceral fat in obese people. We see that Obesity can be associated with a 40% increased risk. This is right out of one of the most prestigious journals in medicine, the Annals of Internal Medicine. Obese men have a 70 to 90% higher risk of developing ED when compared with normal rate men. We see weight loss of as little as 5 to 10% can lead to a significant improvement in erectile function in a very short period of time. So, we see now and we now understand that there's a number of lifestyle changes that we can make that can improve erectile function. And you don't even need to go to the doctor to do that. So it's very cost effective and it'll lead to a healthier, longer and surely happier life. Now, let's turn the page a little bit and let's start to look at some of the psychological things that go on to, uh, uh, to cause ED. It is very well known that when you're in a bad mood, when you've had a bad day at work, uh, and when things just aren't going well, that ED can pop up or maybe not pop up, so to speak, uh, whenever these things uh, kind of present themselves. Those tend to be a little bit more short-term and not really classified as true ED. They, they come along the category of like performance anxiety or anxiety-induced uh, erectile dysfunction on a transient basis. But significant depression and other physiological, I'm sorry, other psychological problems can really be a cause of a long-term erectile dysfunction. You know, the relationship between depressive symptoms and ED is fairly robust, and it's very clear, as pointed out in the Journal of Psychosomatic Medicine, and anxiety itself can produce ED through a variety of uh, mechanisms. Your brain can be overwhelmed, you can have negative emotions, just distraction and you know many times in my office we talk about being in the moment or being present or how you act where you are uh, those are very important things usually this can be overcome with appropriate treatment and counseling you know one of the most important things i we, we have to really come to grips with is that we have to make sure that we're connected to our partner 
because there are a number of us out there that have been through relationship issues and relationship challenges. And if you're just not connected to your partner, performance can really be a problem. Moving on, we're gonna talk about medications. Many drugs and medicines administered by doctors are notorious for causing erectile dysfunction and even a very related but very frustrated problem that is ejaculatory disorder. I've seen a number of men in my office who have the ability to perform, but they just can't get to the ending and it is extremely frustrating for both the guys and their partners. I will tell you what, it is a very frustrating thing. And I've been a miracle worker when I've taken away some of these drugs and have immediately fixed the problem. So these drugs can cause erectile dysfunction and they can cause ejaculation disorders. Things like something as common as hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, beta blockers are notorious, propranolol, atenolol, antidepressants. How many people do you know that are on antidepressants that are complaining of some type of sexual dysfunction? And then other medicines that we see, anti-inflammatories, believe it or not. And why is that? Because anti-inflammatories are notorious for producing our friend again, ED, that is endothelial dysfunction. So if you're taking an anti-inflammatory, stop it, and maybe you'll get some improvement. Histamine blockers, allergy medicines. And then of course, on the right-hand side of your screen here, we can see substances of abuse that can cause erectile dysfunction, things like alcohol, cocaine, marijuana. So if you think you're getting in the mood by getting high, you may just be preventing yourself from performing. So let's, we saw the slide earlier, let's look at some these physiological impediments to erectile dysfunction. I wanna talk about glucose metabolism and insulin resistance, more commonly known as diabetes, <coughs> excuse me but you don't have full-blown diabetes to have problems with erectile dysfunction. Sugar management is probably the number one cause of erectile dysfunction in our country today. So if you have a bad diet, you need to get a good diet, you need to get sugar and carbs out of your life. What we see is that ED can be the first sign of endothelial dysfunction that's mediated by insulin resistance. Insulin resistant states are characterized by defective vascular nitrous oxide, which we're gonna be speaking about shortly. When that production is impaired, the erectile tissue doesn't work properly. So when you can improve your insulin resistance, when you can improve your glucose metabolism, you'll be able to produce nitric oxide more effectively. And you may be able to have better erectile function. Excuse me. So we also see that insulin resistance is independently associated with erectile dysfunction and its severity. So if we improve our sugar metabolism, we're going to improve our erectile function. And here's a couple of more journal articles that go right to that point uh, and, and show that even when you do have a full-blown type 2 diabetes, treatment with oops, excuse me treatment with metformin an improvement of that sugar handling capacity can really make a difference so let's look at cholesterol okay you can see here that dyslipidemia or cholesterol problems is another direct cause of endothelial injury direct, directly leading once again to erectile dysfunction so men with high cholesterol sometimes show up with erectile dysfunction because they're not receiving enough blood flow to the erectile tissues. And you want to know what? It's now become the standard of care. If a man presents to the office and he's complaining of ED, it is essential that significant vascular disease be ruled out. And I am now referring more and more men to cardiologists and finding more and more significant cardiac disease when when present with erectile dysfunction as their first complaint. And we can see here that hyperlipidemia and hypercholesterolemia changes other physiological parameters that leads to erectile dysfunction. So another thing that we can do that doesn't require drugs or therapy in my office is get your cholesterol under control. Eat right, eat healthy foods. Go on that modified Mediterranean diet with no grains. 
get those cholesterol and other physiological parameters under control. Let's look at an inflammatory diet. An inflammatory diet is a diet that produces, as it says, systemic inflammation. When you have systemic inflammation, those free radicals, those things that the inflammation, those inflammatory factors directly attack the lining of the blood vessels. It directly attacks the uh, body's ability to produce nitric oxide. So we need to understand that eating properly can be a very significant way that we can improve erectile dysfunction. What is an inflammatory diet? An inflammatory diet is one that tends to uh, uh, um, obviously produce less inflammation, but it's less reliant upon grains and sugars and carbs and more heavily reliant on things like vegetables and fruits and proteins. And when we focus on a, a vegetable or a plant-based diet, and when we're eating 12 servings of fruits and vegetables a day with a four to one vegetable over fruit ratio, we're gonna find that we're gonna be healthier. And it's really amazing in my office, when I sit down and talk about cholesterol with people and I get them to uh, at least buy my way for a few days or a few weeks and try an anti-inflammatory diet, they feel much better. It's almost like a cloud is lifting. And you know that cloud that lifts in your brain is the same endothelial dysfunction, that same vascular problem that's going on in the erectile tissue. And what do we see? We see that inflammation is covered in at least 1,829 articles that show a link between diet and erectile dysfunction. And that lifestyle habits that decrease low-grade clinical inflammation may have a direct role in the improvement of erectile function. So risk factors that are associated with a pro-inflammatory state result in decreased availability and activity of nitrous oxide, just what I've been talking about, that leads to reduced testosterone levels, more obesity, more glucose and sugar metabolism problems, and all of these things gang up. So an inflammatory diet may be one of the primary instigators of a lot of the physiological issues I discussed a bit earlier. And so our dietary patterns that are full of, of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, Mediterranean diets have been well shown to improve erectile dysfunction. So eat that Mediterranean diet, stay away from the grains, and things will improve in sexual function. Another one is oxidative stress. It's kind of related to um, uh, an inflammatory diet, but antioxidants are a little bit more specific. They're things that come from fruits and vegetables. They can be supplemented in other ways. But when we're suffering oxidative stress, uh, we do have more ED. And here's our friend nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is believed to be the main vasoactive agent that leads to erectile function. You can see it's a complicated uh, chemical pathway here, but as we go through this, what's called the NANC system, we produce nitric oxide that generates byproducts that ultimately lead to smooth muscle relaxation, and that develops a proper erection. And once we're done with all of our food and nutrients, we can try some herbal things. A number of herbal remedies have been well known to be associated with improvement of erectile function, whether it's ginseng, rhodiola, L-arginine is very well known and is quite effective. Uh, I use a uh, product in my office called Stronvivo, which has a heavy dose of arginine. And after 90 days on that product, many men see substantial improvement of the erectile function. It takes a little while for that physiology to recover, but the use of L-arginine can be very, very effective. Yohim bean is another one. One of my favorites is cordyceps. Now, here's an interesting substance. Cordyceps is a fungus that grows out of caterpillar heads, and it was discovered in the high altitudes in the Himalayan mountains. And in fact, the best cordyceps comes from the Himalayan mountains. But what this funny little mushroom does is it enhances the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and it has substances in it that directly heal uh, the endothelium. So wouldn't you know it, the little Sherpas at high levels in the Himalayas would go around, I guess, 
I guess they got hungry and needed something to eat. And so they started eating these little fungus growths. <coughs> and funny enough, excuse me, funny enough, they were able to perform better at higher levels of altitude. So what is cordyceps? It's a vasoreactant. It helps calm down the blood vessels. It makes smooth muscles react. Excuse me, it makes smooth muscles relax. And we saw on an earlier slide, that's exactly one of the end mechanisms that leads to erectile function. It's responsible for endothelium repair. It, it's anti-inflammatory. It promotes endothelial health. It boosts testosterone levels. It makes the platelets quiet down so they're not blocking activity. And this is right out of the Journal of Agricultural Food Chemistry. Uh, cordyceps is really quite miraculous. I recently heard a story of a 76-year-old man who hadn't had sex in 10 years. He didn't want to take testosterone because he was afraid, I'll say unfoundedly afraid, but he was afraid. The doctor convinced him to take cordyceps, and within six months, he was having uh, much improved sexual activity. So it's a quite remarkable substance. Now, we're going to start getting into a little bit more directly medical managed uh, methods. One is to optimize testosterone. It is very clear that men with low testosterone have erectile dysfunction. And what we see here is from the New England Journal of Medicine, probably one of the top journals in all of medicine, it says that men who receive testosterone report better sexual function, activity, desire, and erectile function than men who did not. So balancing hormones is crucial. And in my office, I use it as a building block off for of which we go everywhere else. And then if we're still having trouble, we're gonna go to back to the basics, as I say. Pumps and rings can be very effective. A pump can be used to engorge the penis with blood. The ring can then be put in place to hold that blood there. It'll accomplish successful sexual encounters many, many times, and it is a very effective uh, technique. And uh, there are several things that we do in this office that incorporate the use of pump, pumps and rings for various treatments of various disorders that I see. And then we're gonna get to our favorites. PDE5 inhibitors, or phosphoate diesterase type five inhibitors, okay? they again, are moderated through the nitrous oxide channel again. So what you'll see is that sexual arousal leads to the production of nitric oxide, excuse me. Nitric oxide then stimulates the pathway that we saw on an earlier side. And when this cyclic GMP comes to this stage, it tends to get metabolized away. And if that metabolism is too rapid, too little of the downstream effects occur. What a PDE5 inhibitor does, it blocks the metabolization of the cyclic GMP and it allows more of it to build up, forcing it down the pathway, creating the desired effects of erection. So that's basically how they work. Uh, we just went over that and uh, uh, saw that result. So basically, PDE5 therapy, when compared to placebo, significantly improves the scores uh, on the International Index of Erectile Function and has been found to be very effective in many clinical populations. And I'm sure there's a good number of men out there who have tried them and used them and have had good effect. More and more, they're being used for recreational uh, uh, sex, and they have a very good effect even in healthy guys. And we're all familiar with them. Uh, Viagra or Sildenafil, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra. And there's a couple of add-ons that we can use. And I actually have a couple of compounds in my office that I am very partial to. Uh, ones that include oxytocin or apomorphine can be very effective in improving the function and the effectiveness of the PDE5 inhibitors. Now let's talk about one of my favorites, a brand new and emerging technology that is proving to be extremely effective and beneficial on ED. It's called pulse wave therapy 
or as it's being known in the United States, Gaines wave. The premise of this treatment is shockwave therapy, and it's fairly simple. An oscillating electromagnetic bullet, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute, is used to generate shock waves that are similar to sound waves that pulse through the erectile tissue and cause a minor mini trauma to the blood vessel and the erectile tissue, and it provokes a healing response. Now, what is a shock wave? It's like the thunder after a lightning, a jet breaking the sound barrier, or the crack of a bullet. Or if we look at the history of shock wave, pulse wave therapy, it actually was originated when they observed that men in submarines were being killed by depth charges that caused no damage to the submarine itself. That is, the depth charge would explode outside of the submarine and the shock wave would be transmitted into the submarine and people were having severe internal injuries that caused death. Well, over time, we realized that there was energy in that shock wave and the question was asked as to whether it could be used for medical purposes. And lo and behold, in the 1970s, they started applying shock wave therapy to kidney stones. Many of you out there might have even been treated for kidney stones. Kidney stones can be very painful. I've had them myself. I've had shockwave therapy myself. And I know that it's a blessing to have that pulse uh, treatment break up those things and keep that big stone from passing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Later, it got applied to orthopedic injuries. And it's applied very effectively for the healing of things like shoulder bursitis, tendon. Uh, tendonitis of the elbow or tennis elbow or plantar fasciitis commonly called heel spurs and so we do know that it has direct medical applications and what has happened in many other areas uh, and we'll talk about another one that, uh, in a few minutes uh, shockwave therapy began to be applied to sexual function so how does shockwave therapy work it creates a little pulse that stimulates a biological effect in the cells. These little bubbles that occur collapse and create a force that can actually break down some of the plaque, some of the cholesterol, some of the microclots that are blocking the blood vessels and the circulation leading to the erectile tissue in the penis. It's remarkable. And while it may take six to 12 treatments to get the full effect, because of that breaking down of these pathological deposits, some men may see some improvement in their erectile function after the first treatment. So all we do is we just accumulate hundreds of thousands of these little micro traumas and we stimulate that healing response. Well, the question is, doc, that's crazy. Why does just applying a little vibration to the erectile tissue work? Well, it does. There's over 50 studies now, I just was updated today, in the, in the literature that show that pulse wave therapy can significantly improve erectile function, at least one grade in almost everybody that it's tried on. Now, there are refractory cases, and I can't promise or guarantee a particular result in anybody, but it is extremely effective. The technology is very new to the United States, and it's developing and it's becoming very popular. And what's really quite surprising is recreational use of this therapy is really taking off, particularly in South Florida, and I expect that it will move north. Healthy men are using Gaines Wave therapy for longer duration sexual encounters, faster recovery periods, and harder and firmer erections. And not only does it work on normal guys, it is absolutely working on people with erectile dysfunction. And so here's the literature, it's out there. Low intensity, extracorporeal shockwave therapy enhances BNP, okay? So it does have a healing effect, okay? It improves all kind of cell healing responses. So it's a very effective treatment, it's easy to do, it's virtually painless, it takes about 15 or 20 minutes, the device itself is actually approved by the FDA for similar type treatments, it has a favorable side effect profile with the most that occurs is some minor irritation and some minimal pain uh, that is often 
eliminated with the use of a local anesthetic. It's non-invasive. It's done without drugs. It's very cost effective. It doesn't burn any bridges. And there may be no limit to the benefit that people can achieve. That is, the more you have it done, the more you may be able to heal what's undergoing in the blood vessels in the erectile tissue. So, what does it do? It causes increased sensitivity, decreased refractory time between orgasms, increased erectile quality, larger, more full erections. It, it gives an ease of getting and maintaining erection. It reduces the dependence on Viagra or similar. It actually can even take men who are dependent upon Trimix, which we'll talk about in a bit, and it reduces their reliance on that. And it may actually work when every other treatment has failed. Interestingly, it's even getting good results in post-prostate cancer treatment patients who can be very, very difficult to return at erectile dysfunction if they're so affected after their procedures. So that's gains wave. What about platelet-rich plasma, or the so-called priapus shot? This is one of my favorites. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been doing this procedure in my office for nearly uh, three years now. There's 4,000 articles in the medical literature that show the benefit and healing capacity of platelet-rich plasma. That is a highly concentrated plasma that contains dense concentrations of platelets and other healing factors that can promote a healing response. What it does is it promotes new, new blood vessels and new nerve endings to grow in. It allows for better blood flow and a better erectile function. Uh, in some people, uh, PRP can promote the complete recovery of erectile function, which was not too long ago uh, reported in the Chinese literature. And the interesting thing is, is what we're starting to see is when you activate the healing response with the gains wave or pulse wave therapy and follow up with a PRP or the priapus shot, the results are becoming quite remarkable. So how do we do PRP? We draw some blood, we spin the blood down, we take off this platelet dense area right here, which we can identify, and then we will inject it into the erectile tissue. Again, we do it under a local anesthetic block and it is almost painless. It's really quite amazing how few men complain of any discomfort whatsoever for that procedure. What about Trimix? When we're getting to the end of the line, we really literally do have to try to beat the dead horse. Trimix is a very interesting combination of uh, 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 three drugs, uh, that include a, uh, uh, a vaso I'm sorry, a vasoconstrictor, a uh, prostaglandin, and this can be used uh, very effectively in men who have have not had erections in years. Uh, and, and really, to see the smile on a guy's face or on a couple's face when they can have successful sex once again is amazing. And and this stuff is really really amazing stuff, and, and it works very well. It's safe. It actually is more affordable than PDE5 inhibitors over the counter, uh, though I can tell you that I, I have some techniques and ways that I know how to get PDE5 inhibitors at very, very cost-effective pricing. It's reliable, it's long-lasting, and, and guys who have taken this on and used this uh, uh, recreationally uh, can have three, four, five sexual encounters in one evening uh, with one injection of the Trimix. And you can imagine that guys that haven't been able to have an erection that can have a sustainable erection for an hour or so are going to be extremely happy. Uh, Trimix uh, is uh, well studied in the literature and uh, it is uh, very highly scored with over 77% uh, satisfaction and over 77% improvement in erectile function scores. So what do we do when all else fails? Okay, when it's about time to hang it up. There is one more thing, implants. Uh, it's a very dramatic and it's a very radical procedure, but I'll tell you what, the guys that have it done, that have reached the end of the road, 
Uh, it certainly brings intimacy back into the relationship from a physical standpoint. And, and you know, uh, it, it just is remarkable. Uh, there, there are several different types. There's a non-inflatable type. Uh, they're the least expensive, but they're really the most inconvenient because they're there all of the time. And it, it gets a little bit of, uh, you know, difficulty in, uh, you know, how you dress and, uh, they're really not very much used in the United States anymore. And then you've got, uh, two piece inflatables and, and then three piece in play inflatables or multi-component. And I'm not going to get into all of those. Let's just leave it to be that implants can be very effective when all else has failed. So let's take a step back and let's just kind of summarize everything. Erectile dysfunction is a multifactorial problem. It comes from physiology to physical issues to vascular issues to diet to nitric oxide to we've been over a number of them. There may be no silver bullet treatment. And what I've learned long ago is that it may take a combination of a number of these things that we talked about in this webinar uh, in order to get a successful outcome. Some people, they might need just half of a PDE5 inhibitor, half of a Viagra. Some people, just a small shot of Trimix. And one simple thing can do it. Other people, it can take a little bit of work. It can take a little bit of effort. But I will tell you that in the long run, it can be very worth it and it can be very rewarding. So most men will improve to one degree or another with some combination of the treatments outlined. My success rate is very, very good. Some guys I can take back to when they were back in their 20s. Other guys, just an improvement to function is gonna be sufficient for them and that may be all we can get. So again, what are the treatments available? We've got our lifestyle changes, smoking, exercise, obesity, improve our emotional state, eliminate medications known to cause erectile dysfunction, improve the physiology in your metabolism. There's several herbal remedies that can be effective. Uh, then we get into more medical oriented things, optimize the testosterone, pumps and rings, PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, or Stendra. Pulse wave therapy, which is rapidly becoming one of my favorites. The Priapus shot, Trimix, and then finally implants. So we've talked about 21 ways to treat erectile dysfunction in men, and these actually work. The science is there, the medicine is there, and men are happy when these techniques are used either singly or in combination. And I'm Dr. John Carazella from the Florida Center of Hormones and Wellness. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, please email me at this email address. That's john at hormonesandwellness.com. That's john at hormonesandwellness.com, just like it sounds. So I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, this is my office telephone number. I'm available for consultations. And most of my Gaines Wave and Priapus shot consultations are with absolutely no charge. So I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you found it interesting and informative. And again, I'm happy to take questions. Take care.